This is the second of two lectures, and in this lecture we're going to continue our introduction to the human body. We're focusing on two main things today. We're going to focus on microscopic anatomy and then clinical anatomy. So let's go ahead and get started with micros microscopic anatomy. So there are three types of microscopy that are commonly used in anatomy today. The first is something called light microscopy. And this is an image of ciliated epithelium taken with a light microscope. You'll notice some of the benefits of light microscopy are that you can see things in color. It's a great benefit. Uh, you can actually image a live or a dead sample. So that's very nice as well. However, uh, a drawback of light microscopy is you don't really get a high resolution image. So you're somewhat limited by the wavelength of light. If you want to get a higher resolution image, you have to turn to a second type of microscopy called transmission electron microscopy or TEM. And this basically is a more uh, zoomed in image, right? Or higher resolution image. And it's taken of the box that's at the top of the light microscope image. And we're going to enlarge that black box. So let's take a look. This is our transmission electron microscope image. And you can tell uh, that we have much higher resolution. Uh, that's a benefit. A drawback with transmission electron microscopy is that the sample has to be dead. Okay, so you cannot image a live sample. And then also you'll notice that the image is not in color. Uh, if you ever see a transmission electron microscope image that is in color, it's pretty much artificial color that's been added to the image. So you can't really get a true uh, image in color. But you do get that high resolution, which is nice. A third type of microscopy is something called scanning electron microscopy. Uh, this also gives you fairly high resolution uh, image or images. Uh, not as high as TEM, but pretty high. And a benefit of scanning electron microscopy is that you actually uh, see things more in three dimensions. And so you could see here on this image on the bottom right, it's a nice three-dimensional image. The color on this image is also artificial. Again, with uh, just like TEM, with SEM, the sample has to be dead. Okay, so that's a drawback. You cannot image live samples with any type of electron microscopy. Okay, so how are tissues prepared for microscopy, right? This is something we're going to focus on here. So how are tissues prepared? Well, the first thing is that the specimen is going to be fixed and then sectioned. By fixed, what we mean is the sample is going to be killed, uh, either with heat or with a chemical called formaldehyde uh, or methanol. There's many ways to fix it, but you'll kill the sample, and then you'll section it or you'll cut it into thin uh, strips. And the instrument used to section it is this one here, something called a microtome. After you do that, then the sample has to be stained, right? And there's many, many different ways to stain the samples. Uh, there's acidic stains, there's basic stains. But really what you're doing is you're accentuating structures. You're making sure that you can tell the difference between different anatomical structures that might otherwise be hard to see you know, if you had not stained them. And this is showing that over here on the right. Uh, we can have chemical stains. We can also stain things with antibodies that are fluorescently labeled. Uh, so really nowadays, the imaging uh, techniques are really accentuated in a nice way uh, via staining the samples. And then finally, what happens is you have to mount the sample and image the sample. Mounting means that you put the sample, uh, which is probably on a cover slip at this stage, uh, all of those different techniques, but you put it on a slide. That's what mounting means. And you put some type of preservative, some type of mounting media that preserves the colors that you're using. Uh, you know, with the antibodies or something. So it's like an anti-fade media. But you'll mount it on a slide, and then you'll image it with any of the types of microscopy that we talked about. Uh, the procedure I'm showing you here is generic to light microscopy and electron microscopy, but realize that uh, there are differences between the two. So this is sort of a generic protocol. And you can see you get a nice, uh, beautiful image here where you could see the nuclei of cells right on the bottom right. Uh, they're darkly stained uh, in uh, maybe a dark purple color, whereas the cytoplasm of the cell is more of a pink color. So you get a nice stain like that. You'll see images uh, throughout our lectures uh, you know, that are prepared through this mechanism. Okay, so something to consider, though, is when you're fixing, you're killing something, you're sectioning it, you're staining it, you're mounting it, does it affect the way the tissue looks? right? And the answer is yes, it does. Often we'll have things that are called artifacts that occur. And so an artifact is a distortion, right? In other words, the tissue doesn't look exactly how it should look, but there's things that are slightly different because of the technique you used. We never want artifacts, but it's a necessary evil, right? It's something that happens when you're you know, doing this technique. So uh, the better you get at a given staining technique and imaging technique, the more you can reduce the artifacts, but to some degree, they're always gonna be present. We have to acknowledge it. So an artifact is something that, you know, the technique, the staining technique itself, the fixing technique itself caused. So for example, on the image on the right here, you'll see that we have these structures here, these sort of hollow structures. You see a bunch of them here, right, right here, 
see a bunch here. You might think those are some structure in the tissue or some type of vacuole or something. And the answer is, no, they're not. They're actually air bubbles. And so you can see that you have to learn what artifacts typically uh, come about with different techniques. You can properly interpret the image. Okay, so that's a little taste of uh, microscopic anatomy. Let's turn to some advanced imaging techniques, which is uh, defined by clinical anatomy. Okay, so the first few techniques I show you are all based upon x-rays with different tweaks. So I want to first take a step back and say, what are x-rays and how are they used to detect abnormalities? So x-rays are basically uh, electromagnetic waves that have a very short wavelength. So if we looked at the electromagnetic spectrum here on the right, you can see that in the middle of this spectrum, we have visible light. This visible light is with light that you can see with your naked eye. If we go uh, to the left on this spectrum, we have longer wavelengths. We get the things that are microwaves, radio waves. Uh, these are usually not considered that dangerous, which is good, right? Any urban area of radio waves coursing all over the place, so it's good that they're not dangerous. But if you go the other way on the spectrum, if you go to the right here, you'll notice that you start to delve into things that are UV light, right? And we know that too much UV exposure can cause skin cancer. So that's something that's not good. If you go a little bit shorter wavelengths, here you, lie, you, um, you reside in the area of the X-ray. And this is something that is really manipulated a lot in biomedical science. And we use it a lot to distinguish different anatomical structures. Okay, so what kind of structures do we uh, image with X-rays? Well, it's best for visualizing bone or other uh, dense structures that you would see in the body. So we'll give you some examples in a second. Uh, you could see here on the image on the left on the bottom, this is an x-ray image where you could see that the lighter areas are the areas that are more compact, right? So you could see here that we see the ribs sort of outlined here in a little bit lighter color. Uh, we have the sternum here, right, in a little bit lighter color. The reason is, is the x-rays cannot penetrate through those dense structures, and so they, uh, on the image, they appear whiter, those types of structures. Areas where the x-rays can penetrate appear darker. So if you look here on the right here, between the ribs, oops, excuse me, between the ribs here, right, you have a dark structure because the x-rays can penetrate very easily. Other things that we can do is, uh, x-rays are not really good at imaging soft tissues. So if we want to look at things such as uh, the digestive tract, we might have to actually introduce or inject a heavy, a heavy metal, uh, something like barium, into the large intestine here. And so you can see that barium here is sort of injected. Then we can apply our x-ray, and then we can actually see uh, that structure. So sometimes you have to combine the x-ray x -ray, excuse me, uh, with some other type of heavy metal to actually get some uh, you know, decent images of soft structures. Okay, so let's apply this. So what you saw on the previous slide was a basic x-ray. Let's up the ante a little bit. Uh, this also relies upon x-ray technology, but let's look at something called a computed axial tomography uh, type of um, uh, analysis. It, sometimes it's called a CT scan or a CAT scan. So how do we use this to detect abnormalities? So really what this is, as I mentioned before, it relies on x-rays, but you're taking a bunch of x-rays sort of uh, around a person's circumference. So a bunch of x-rays from different angles, and you put those x-rays together to construct an image. And that's how you get some detailed picture of a certain section of the body. So really, as I mentioned, this is sort of x-rays on steroids, right? So there's our steroids. <laughs> okay, so what does it look like? Here's someone entering into that machine, right? So they're entering in to uh, take a CAT scan. And you can see that when you take these series of x-rays from different angles, you're actually able to reconstruct a plane and get a nice x-ray image here of a plane. So this is a transverse cut through this individual. Right? And this is your view, as the image suggests. And this is what you see here on the right. So that's something that you could get with a little bit of advanced x-ray technique. Okay, one thing to remind you of, at this stage in the game, we're really focusing on what are these imaging techniques, right? I'm not really so much interested that the liver is located here, oops, excuse me, or that the stomach is here, or that the colon is here. Uh, later, in later lectures, I will want you to know that, but today we're focusing on the techniques. Okay, so what are some other advanced imaging x-ray techniques? Well, there's something called angiography. And this is something uh, where you highlight certain structures like blood vessels. Uh, and there's actually a more advanced version of it, something called digital subtraction angiography, or DSA. And in this one, what happens is you actually... Um, take images before and after you inject some type of contrast agent into someone. And so for example, what you could do is you take a picture of someone's blood vessels first, 
then you inject some type of contrast agent that you'll detect with this technique. And then you take those two pictures, you layer them together, and you subtract the before from the after image. And using techniques like this, you can actually see, does someone have narrowing of the arteries, right? Uh, sort of a nice technique that you could use. Again, this is called angiography. Okay, so how do we uh, use uh, x-ray technology to image cellular activity, right? To look at cellular activity. And you might say, why would you want to look at the activity of a cell? And there's a few reasons why. Well, can you think of any cells that grow out of control and that are dangerous for us? Well, I can think of one, right? Cancer. So cancer is something that we're really concerned of. Excuse my hideous handwriting, <laughs> but cancer. So how do we use x-rays to detect cancer? So this is one way. We could use something called positon emission tomography, right? Positon, posit, positron, excuse me, emission tomography. And it's abbreviated uh, PET scan. And what we're doing in this technique is we're actually going to be detecting uh, radioactive isotopes that are injected into the body. So for example, you take a syringe filled uh, full of some radio um, actively labeled water or sugar, right? You inject it into a person. And what happens is the cells that are most uh, highly metabolically active, right? That are dividing at the fastest rate are going to take up that radioactive isotope. And if you know the structures of the body, if you know the anatomy, you'll see where abnormal masses appear that shouldn't be there. So for example, here you could see a tumor. Here you could see a term, tumor, right? So one in the breast, one in the liver. And what you can do then is you can say, okay, after we treat this person, either with uh, you know radiation or chemotherapy or surgery or a combination of all of these, we can do the same imaging technique afterwards and we can see, do we see that tumor anymore in the breast? Do we see that tumor anymore in the liver? And the answer on this diagram is no. So you can see that's a really nice technique, again, called a PET scan, right? Positron emission tomography, where we combine x-rays with some radioactively labeled uh, contrast agent. Okay, so what is one of the safest imaging techniques that we have? Well, it's something called ultrasound. And what this uses is it uses very high uh, frequency radio waves, right? Uh, remember, radio waves are not very dangerous to humans, which is nice. Uh, and we use those to take images of things that you know require that type of care. So for example, uh, determining the age of a fetus. You're not going to be introducing radioactivity into the womb or x-rays into the womb because those might damage the fetus. They might, uh, you know, cause cancer, right? Or they might kill the fetus because, um, you know, radiation and x-rays are both considered mutagens. They might say, well, why would we use them, period? It's all about the pros and cons, right? You know, does the benefit you get from a given imaging technique outweigh the risks that technique causes? And Often the answer is yes, right? And so we feel okay with doing these different techniques. But still, with something like a fetus, you want to use ultrasound. We're bouncing high radio, uh, high frequency radio waves, uh, you know, off the fetus, and you can get a nice image here to see what the fetus looks like. And you might say, how's this image constructed? Well, it's really constructed because um, different tissues in the fetus uh, have different densities, and the density of different tissues affects the way the radio waves hit that tissue and then bounce back. Right? And so by looking at the differential uh, rate of the radio waves hitting the tissue and bouncing back because of the density of the tissue, you can reconstruct an image like this. So you can see the skull of the fetus, right? You can measure it to see, you know, what is the age of the child? You can look for organs, you know, is the fetus developing correctly? You can look for limbs, right? And so that's a really nice technique that's very common in pregnancy. Okay, so how do we obtain a contra high contrast image of soft tissue? Remember, x-rays give us a very nice high contrast image of, of uh, dense tissue like bone, but not so much of soft tissue. So how do we do it with soft tissue? We really look towards something called MRI, right? MRI imaging. And this type of imaging is a very interesting image. And with this image, what you can do is you can say, okay, you know, is someone's meniscus intact? Or is there a tear? And you could see that here with that little flap right in the middle of that region, right about there by that dot. So it's a really nice technique, again, called MRI. It stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And it distinguishes uh, different body tissues based on their relative water content. You might say, okay, well, how the heck does it do that? Well, to give you a brief sort of analysis, think of it as a few steps, right? So step one, what happens is you put the person into this magnetic field. And what happens is the hydrogen atoms uh, in their tissue align parallel to this magnetic field. 
Then what happens is you blast that, so that's sort of step one, right? Step two is you blast that magnetic field with a radio wave. And what happens is it basically causes those nuclei of those hydrogen atoms that were aligned in the magnetic field to become misaligned, right? So they get temporarily misaligned. Then what you do is you stop that radio wave, right? You stop blasting with radio waves. And what happens is the nuclei of the hydrogen atoms relax again, right? Or re-relax to align with that magnetic field. As they relax, they give off a signal, and that signal is what is used to produce these types of images. So a very, very uh, neat technique. To go back a second, you might say, well, what are the pros and cons of MRI? Well, you know, there's some pros and cons, right? A pro is you get very high contrast images of soft tissue, which is great. Uh, you can see that's sort of the title of the slide here, right? Some cons are that it's a very slow technique. So it's not something you would use if someone had a gunshot wound or something. You know, it, it takes a long time to do this technique. So it's more used for, uh, you know, uh, non-emergency procedures. Another issue with MRI, though, is that um, actually if someone has certain medical devices implanted into their body, they might not be able to do MRI imaging because it might cause problems with those medical devices. So there's pros and cons in any imaging technique that you see. Okay, so that's our introduction uh, to the human body continued, right? So today we focused on microscopic anatomy, we focused on clinical anatomy, uh, and some advanced techniques there. As you see pictures throughout uh, later lectures, I want you to sort of refresh your memory and remind yourself about how these pictures were obtained, what artifacts may or may not be there, and it will really help you uh, interpret the anatomy you're looking at. So that's why it's important to have a good understanding of these different mic uh, microscopic and clinical uh, techniques that are used. As always, make sure that you know these learning objectives before you proceed to the next lecture.